So as Pastor Vicki mentioned, uh, yes, we've known each other for about 20 years, I would say, since I was a late teenager when we moved to Connecticut. So <laughs> about 20 years or so. <laughs> yes, yes, when Pastor Vicki is a teenager as well. Um, but it's a privilege and an honor to be able to come here and speak with you this morning. So thank you for the invite. Um, I want to just share, there's a couple of pictures that I'm going to have Sam put up. Those are my children, uh, Trent, who is 10, and Sydney, who just turned five uh, a few weeks ago. These are my pride and joy. These are two things that we love to do. We love to go um, on the Farmington River and paddleboard in the summer. I don't know if you've ever done that. It's in Collinsville. It's a great little place. They have kayaking as well. And we also like to hike. And so those are just a couple of pictures of my children. And I love them. Just to share a quick little story. I was doing devotions with them one evening. And at the end, they take turns praying. And and then it was my turn. And so we prayed. And I was just thinking, just a little testimony. I was thinking about how my life has turned out a little bit different than I had hoped or expected. It's just the three of us. And... The Lord brought to my mind that scripture from Ecclesiastes 4 where it says that a cord of three strands is not easily broken. And the Lord was reminding me that evening that he was binding the three of us together and making us stronger because we were together. And so I'm grateful for the children that are that the Lord has blessed me with and to care for, to train them up, to teach him to teach them about him. Um, <clears throat> there's also a couple of, or a few books I'm going to recommend this morning is sort of the thing I took from my dad. But the three books, and I'm going to be sharing a few quotes from them. So if you're interested, you can see me after. You can pick them up. One of the books I'm going to be quoting from is from Timothy Keller. He's one of my favorite theologians out there. He uh, used to be a pastor of Redeemer Church in New York City, and now he just travels and speaks and he writes books. He didn't start writing books until the age of 60, which I did not know. But yeah, he was 60 years old and started pastoring at 40 in New York City. And so this book is called Counterfeit Gods, The Empty Promises of Money, Sex, and Power, and the Only Hope That Matters. It's a short little book. It's an easy read. And then the other one is by Elizabeth Elliot called The Path of Loneliness. This is a, it took me a long time to even pick this book up because I didn't want to read it. <laughs> I didn't really want to hear what she had to say, but it's f- excellent. And then this latest one I just got in 2019 and finished it in a matter of two days. It was not an easy read, but I couldn't put it down. It has so much good stuff to say. It's Breaking the Marriage Idol by Cutter Calloway. And it's Reconstructing Our Culture and Spiritual Norms. Excellent book. All right. So this morning, we're going to be looking at John chapter 4 and reading the first 30 verses. Uh, I'm going to be reading from the Christian Standard Bible. So I do have it up there. I know it's really small. So if you do have your Bibles or you have an app on your phone, John chapter 4. And again, I'm reading from the Christian Standard Bible. I'll let some of you all get there. It's the story about Jesus encountering the Samaritan woman. So when Jesus learned that the Pharisees had heard he was making and baptizing more disciples than John, though Jesus himself was not baptizing, but his disciples were, he left Judea and went again to Galilee. He had to travel through Samaria. So he came to a town of Samaria called Sychar, near the property that Jacob had given his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there, and Jesus, worn out from his journey, sat down at the well. It was about noon. A woman of Samaria came to draw water. Give me a drink, Jesus said to her, because his disciples had gone into town to buy food. How is it that you, a Jew, ask for a drink from me, a Samaritan woman, she asked him. For Jews do not associate with Samaritans. Jesus answered, If you knew the gift of God... And who is saying to you, give me a drink, you would ask him, and he would give you living water. Sir, said the woman, you don't even have a bucket, and the well is deep. So where do you get this living water? You aren't greater than our father Jacob, are you? He gave us the well and drank from it himself, as he did his sons and livestock. Jesus said, everyone who drinks from this water will get thirsty again. But whoever drinks from the water that I will give him will never thirsty again. In fact, the water I will give him will become a well of water springing up in him for eternal life. Sir, the woman said to him, give me this water so that I won't get thirsty and come here to draw water. 
Go call your husband, he told her, and come back here. I don't have a husband, she answered. You have correctly said, I don't have a husband, Jesus said. For you have had five husbands, and the man you are now now have is not your husband. What you have said is true. Sir, the woman replied, I see that you are a prophet. Our fathers worshipped on this mountain, but you Jews say that the place to worship is in Jerusalem. And Jesus told her, Believe me, woman, an hour is coming when you will worship the Father neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. You Samaritans worship what you do not know. We worship what we do know because salvation is from the Jews. But an hour is coming and is now here when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. Yes, the Father wants such people to worship him. God is spirit and those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. The woman said to him, I know that the Messiah is coming, who is called Christ. When he comes, he will explain everything to us. Jesus told her, I, the one speaking to you, am he. Just then his disciples arrived, and they were amazed that he was talking with a woman. Yet no one said, What do you want, or why are you talking with her? Then the woman left her water jar, went into town, and told the people, Come see a man who told me everything I ever did. Could this be the Messiah? And they left the town and made their way to him. That's the word of the Lord. Let's pray. Lord, I thank you for this time here this morning, gathering with your people together. I pray that this word would be an encouragement to your people, that it would be one that challenges us to to look at your word differently and in a new way. In your name we pray. Amen. 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 So this is supposed to be my water jar. <laughs> uh, I'm not sure if that's what it looked like, but and everybody ha- should have a piece of uh, paper and a pen, and we're going to get to that at the end. But everybody has that, right? Okay, good. So the title of my message this morning it's called "Leave Your Bucket." Growing up, I was obsessed with love and stories about love. One of my favorite movies, uh, some of you may know, the Anna Green Gables series uh, is out of Canada. I think one of the reasons why I liked it so much is because Anne was a girl who spoke her mind. And she didn't let some silly little crush keep her from what she wanted to accomplish in life. And while her crush, whose name was Gilbert, expressed his undying love for her, she refuses him because she feels like he's going to hold her back from all that she wanted to accomplish as a writer and a teacher. And so they go their separate ways for a few years, and Anne even accepts another engagement from another man, which she ends realizing that the only man she's ever really loved all along has been Gilbert. And eventually, uh, Anne sees that Gilbert never wanted, nor would he have ever held her back. And in fact, in a few instances, he actually gave up his own dreams to help her fulfill hers. And so in the end of the series, she, of course, declares her love for him, telling him that he's always been the one for her and that she's always been in love with him. And I thought as a teenager growing up, that this, even in my early 20s, that this would somehow be how my life was going to play out. Until it didn't. (laughs) And I attended Bible school and wanted to serve in ministry. And I also thought, well, maybe here's where I'll meet my future husband. Until that didn't happen. (laughs) And so I loved my Bible school years, and I I made lifelong friends, which I still keep in contact with today. I did not meet my Gilbert. And so after graduating from Bible school, I moved to Florida and was helping in the church down there as a junior high youth pastor. And I thought, yes, this is the time. I'm serving in ministry. I'm doing what God's called me to do. I'll meet my Gilbert here. Until I didn't. And so a couple years goes by, and I was getting awfully lonely, missing my family, missing my friends from Connecticut. And so I decided to move back home. While I disliked the cold, I said to myself, I would rather be cold than lonely. (laughs) And so when I moved back home, I was about 23 at that time and really became discontented with my life and my love life or really lack thereof. And so I took matters into my own hands and went looking for love. And no matter what the compromise or cost was, I was determined to find love. Because you see, while I didn't recognize it at the time in my 20s, I had made romantic love an idol and that I believed the lies that that if someone didn't love me, then my life had no meaning or, or any value. 
And so I met a man at the age of, uh, I married a man at the age of 26. I met him at 24. And about eight years later, five months after the birth of my daughter, Sydney, I was filing for divorce. After years of counseling and working through some really difficult issues, the marriage ended with my then husband standing in the kitchen telling me that he didn't think he loved me anymore or that he wanted to be married to me anymore. I felt like a Mack truck had just hit me (laughs) and somebody had punched me in the gut and I couldn't catch my breath. In a matter of about two months, I lost 25 pounds. I felt like there was no light at the end of the tunnel, that my life would always look black and dark. And while I had known rejection, a little bit of rejection in my teenage years from peers making fun of me, I hadn't known this kind of rejection before, and it nearly destroyed my life. In Elizabeth Elliott's book, In the Path of Loneliness, the one that I recommended, she describes rejection like this, and this is how I felt. She said, Perhaps there is no more bitter loneliness than that of rejection. Not only must one learn to do without someone he had come to feel he could not live without, but he must endure dagger thrusts to the heart such as, You deserve to be rejected. You are not worthy to be loved. You will never be loved. Who would want you? You are condemned to loneliness forever, and nobody cares. And I truly felt that way, that nobody cared, and I was condemned to loneliness forever. And in the midst of that pain and loss, God also began to reveal to me some things that had been deeply rooted in my life since I was a teenager. I had made romantic love and sexual fulfillment the be-all and end-all in life. I had made marriage an idol. The very thing that I had worshipped since I was a kid was now destroyed. The very thing I had put my hopes and my dreams in came crashing down. Because much like this woman that we just read about, I was looking to something besides God to fulfill my deepest longings. How do you know you've made something an idol in your life? Well, Tim Keller describes an idol like this. He says, it's anything more important to you than God. It's anything that absorbs your heart and imagination more than God. Anything you seek to give you what only God can give you. An idol is whatever you look at and say in your heart of hearts, if I have that, then I'll feel my life has meaning. Then I'll know I have value. Then I'll feel significant and secure. I felt as if my life had no value unless I was loved by a man. But then I read this passage from John chapter 4, and my life hasn't been the same since. To just When Jesus came on the scene here in John chapter 4, he entered into this woman's life, life, which was quite a mess. Just to give you a little background of what was going on, the first thing that we see is the, t- the time of day was mentioned. It was about noon. So women in that day often went to the well early in the morning when it was cool to get water to prepare for the day's work and chores, not at noon when it was hot. And we learn later in the story that she was a social and moral outcast, which is why she was there at that particular time of day. But Jesus, doing what he always does, comes in and sort of breaks the norms of our culture. He first broke the gender barrier. In those days, it was a patriarchal culture where men didn't talk with women in public that they didn't know. And we see this clearly from the reaction of the disciples in verse 27, where it says that they were amazed that he was talking with a woman. And then he also breaks the racial barriers. The Jews and the Samaritans in that time hated each other. And we see that from the Samaritan's woman reaction when Jesus talks with her in verse 10. He says, how is it that you, a Jew, ask, she says, how is it a, you, a Jew, ask for a drink from me, a Samaritan woman? For Jews do not associate with Samaritans. And just a little side note, anyone who says the Bible is anti-women or sexist just has to read the story and countless others in the Bible to see how untrue of a statement that is. Jesus did not conform to cultural norms often. He often broke through those norms to show us how it is we ought to love each other and to give dignity to every human being, regardless of race or gender or age, because we are all image bearers of God. And Jesus doesn't start the conversation off with the fact that she has gone through five husbands. Instead, he begins the conversation by revealing himself. The gift Jesus is referring to in verse 10 is himself. So we see him first coming with grace and then truth. 
He goes on to say in verse 13 that if you keep trying to fill your life with earth, earthly pleasures, you may be satisfied for a time, but before long, you'll be back with an empty bucket, filling it again with things that cannot yield a lasting satisfaction. The Rolling Stones wrote a song, and some of you may remember it, <laughs> uh, some of you older folks, uh, but you remember the song, I can't, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> older, not old, older, <laughs> uh, wrote, I can't get no satisfaction, Do you get, anybody remember that song? No, no, no. <laughs> You want to, can you sing it? Do you remember the, the lines? I can't, I don't have Mick Jagger's voice, but you know, it's like, I can't get no satisfaction. I can't, and I try, and I try, and I try. I can't get no. Anyway, so, <laughs> satisfaction. Um, but the Rolling Stones, you know, they had the fame, they had the fortune, they had all the sexual pleasure that they could want. And yet they still write a song about not being able to find the satisfaction. And this is what Jesus was saying to the woman at the well. He said, you can try, and you can try, and you can try. But every time you're going to come back thirsting. And just a couple chapters later in John, Jesus is speaking with a crowd that he just fed. He's fed with the fish and the the bread. And he says in John 6.35, he says, I am the bread of life. No one who comes to me will ever be hungry and no one who believes in me will ever be thirsty again. Sam Alberry says this. He says, when Jesus says, I am the bread of life, he is saying, I am to your soul what bread is to a starving stomach. I am the only one who can satisfy you at the deepest level. So many of us in our culture are looking for the bread of life in romantic and sexual fulfillment and wondering why we are still hungry. Romantic love became an idol in my life because I doubted that God was enough. Instead, I went looking elsewhere to try and quench my thirst for love. And let me tell you, it did not end well. Romantic love became an idol because I was afraid that being single meant being lonely for the rest of my life. And the Lord has helped to dismantle that fear and remove those lies that he told me he's, that because he is enough by bringing people into my life who are single and who are living a satisfied and full life in Christ. People who have a real deep understanding that their worth and their value is not founded in another person, but it is found in Christ. And I'm so grateful that the Lord has brought Pastor Vicki into my life, <laughs> especially in these last few years. And the Lord has used you to speak life and hope into my life as a single woman. About a year and a half ago, you may remember this, but we were out to dinner at that, uh, was it, I, no, it was an IHOP, uh, oh, great. <laughs> chips in Southington. And I was spilling my guts to her, as I often do when we get together, and just sort of telling her about my fear of being single for the rest of my life. And I said, Pastor Vicki, I said, I, I don't know how I'm going to make it as a single woman for the rest of my life. And she said something to me that was, so simple, but something that I've held on to, and it's helped me tremendously. She said, Melody, don't think about how you're going to make it the rest of your life as a single woman, but live in the grace that God has for you today. Not tomorrow, but today. And so don't think about how you're going to make it five years from now or ten years from now as a single woman. Just take it each day as it comes and walk in the grace that he has for you today. And so when the holidays come around... And the ache for companionship feels so strong. I remember those words from Pastor Vicki that she shared with me. And I look to God's word from 2 Corinthians 12, 9. And I speak it to my soul. And I can hear the Lord saying to me, Melody, my grace is sufficient for you. For my power is made perfect in your weakness. This isn't just a nice Bible verse that I memorized as a kid. No, I'm taking God at his word. He promised that his grace would be enough, that his power works best in my weakness. His word is my strength. His word is my hope. And it's how I get through those difficult holiday seasons. I cling to the word of God, and I cling to the words of Pastor Vicki. (laughs) And I'm so grateful 
for godly parents. God gives us people to lean on to be that grace and source of strength during difficult seasons. And just this past Christmas, I had called my mom in tears. It was just a diff- it's a difficult time for me, the holidays. And she reminded me, she prayed with me, she reminded me of the promises that God has spoken over my life. And so his grace, God's grace was being shown and given to me through my mom. Lean on the people that God has placed in your life. <coughs> and then pray. If you feel like, well, I don't have anybody, then pray that God brings people into your life to be a source of strength and grace to help you walk through the difficult seasons. And I'm learning to take each day as it comes now so that I don't think about how it is that I'm going to make it five years from now or ten years from now as a single mom, but instead I live in and through the power of his word and I live in the grace he's promised me for today. And as we continue this story, we see the woman trying to get Jesus to talk about something else other than her. So she brings up the debate that was happening in that time about where the right place to worship was. And Jesus was patient with her, and he answers her question, but he brings a conversation back around to what she so desperately needed to know and hear. And in verse 16, Jesus tells the woman to go get her husband, and we find out that she didn't have a husband, but in fact has had five, and the man that she was currently living with or with wasn't even her husband. So I think that this woman not only was literally looking for love in all the wrong places, but she feared being alone. She feared loneliness and what it would look like to truly be alone. And let me just say, if loneliness could solve, be solved with a spouse and romantic love, then this woman wouldn't have gone through five husbands. In uh, the book Breaking the Marriage Idol, Cutter Calloway says, The answer to being alone is not marriage, it's community. Rather, it's communion with God and with each other. And so this woman, she wasn't, see- she was seeking to satisfy her basic aching for otherness with some other means than God. And Elizabeth Elliot, you know, she knew a lot about loss. She knew a lot about rejection. She had waited five years to marry <laughs> Jim Elliot. And about a year or so later, he was martyred. And about ten years later, she remarried another man and he passed away. <laughs> So she has known that path, which is why she wrote that book, The Path of Loneliness. She has known that path. And she says in her book, she says this, and I just think it's beautiful about loneliness. She said, our loneliness cannot always be fixed, but it can always be accepted as the very will of God for now. And that turns it into something beautiful. Perhaps it is like the field wherein lies the valuable treasure. We must buy the field. It is no sun-drenched meadow embroidered with wildflowers. It is a bleak and empty place, but once we know it contains a jewel, the whole picture changes. The empty scrap of forgotten land suddenly teems with possibilities. Here is something we can not only accept, but something we're selling everything to buy. In my case, selling everything meant giving up the self-pity and bitter questions. I do not mean we are to go out looking for chances to be lonely as possible. I am talking about acceptance of the inevitable. And when, through a willed act, we receive this thing we did not want, then loneliness, the name of the field nobody wants, is transformed into a place of hidden treasure. And so all of us, at some point in our lives, we will walk through seasons of loneliness. I think a lot of times it's God's way of getting our attention off of the things that we have looked to to distract ourselves from the emptiness we feel from chasing after things that just won't do it for us. Helping us to realize that these things, you know, that this isn't going to fit, it's not going to fix what's broken in me. This relationship isn't going to fix what's broken in me. But to understand and realize Jesus will. And the treasure that is in this field that she's referring to is Jesus. And so we can say, as the Apostle Paul said in Philippians 3, I consider everything to be a loss in view of the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. And if I could just say this, that we are not going to make it through this life without the community of believers. We need the church. We need each other. I feel this now more than ever as a single woman. The ways in which our churches have structured themselves has been that somehow families are more valuable than singles. And that needs to change because it's not true. 
We, we have the church for this very reason, so that no one feels as if they are alone. Or as if they are somehow less than if they haven't been married with the 2.4 children. <laughs> but our lives are valuable. They have meaning because we are loved by our creator and loved by his people. Because we are sons and we are daughters of the king. And towards the end of this story, Jesus has captured her attention because he is seen in her heart. And she says in verse 25, she says, I know there is a Messiah who is called Christ that is coming. And when he comes, he will explain everything to us. And Jesus here so beautifully answers, I love this. This is what changed my life. He said, I, the one speaking to you, am he. Here's what Jesus was saying to her. And when he says to all of us to this morning, not only do I have what you are looking for, but I am what you are looking for. We talk so much in our culture about finding the one. Well, Jesus tells us here in this beautiful story, you're searching, your waiting days are over, you don't have to swipe right, you don't have to swipe left. I'm the one. And the saying is true that Jesus is all you need when Jesus is all you have. And two and a half years ago, I was sitting in my living room. I was crying out to the Lord. My life was a mess. I was broken. I was lost, much like this woman. I was searching for love in all the wrong places. And then the Lord spoke to the very depths of my soul, and he said, Melody, I'm the one you're looking for. Everything you'll ever need or long for is found in me. And I received his gift that day, and my life has not been the same since. And this is what he speaks to all of us today. And I'm going to conclude with this this morning. In verse 28, it says, Then the woman left her water jar, went into town, and told the people, Come see a man who told me everything I ever did. It's every human's desire to be fully known and fully loved. And in Jesus, we are fully known, flaws and all, (laughs) and in him, fully loved. The Samaritan woman left her bucket. Her old ways of trying to fill her deepest longings with men, those days were done. She met the Messiah that day. She met the man of her dreams that day. And her life was never the same. And so this morning, what's in your bucket? What things have you looked to to fill your deepest longings with besides the Lord? Are there any idols in your life that you need to leave behind this morning? Things you've looked at and said, if I don't have this or if I don't accomplish that, then my life has no purpose or meaning or value. You've all received a little piece of paper. And in these next few minutes, I just want you to search your heart and ask the Lord, is there anything that I've looked to besides you to, to say this is what's going to give me purpose or a sense of accomplishment in life? Have you looked to anything besides him to fulfill those deepest longings that you have? It's a new year. It's 2019. Let's move forward looking to Jesus to be the one that our hearts long for and desire, knowing that when I look to him, he takes care of the rest. And so hear Jesus speaking to you this morning. Leave your bucket, because not only do I have what you are looking for, I am what you are looking for. So if maybe, Sam, you just want to play a song, maybe Reckless Love, we'll just take a few minutes and just write down on the piece of paper. And then what we're going to do, we've got this little tin can here, We're going to leave it in the bucket. We're going to leave our buckets behind. We're going to leave the water jar behind this morning. And just put them in here. If you don't want to come up, you don't have to. But if you want to, just take some time and and think about some things that you've looked to besides the Lord to try and fulfill those longings.